live. And that means that I, I, I want to welcome everybody uh, on board. Uh, first of all, obviously, all the, all the viewers from uh, all around the world. How cool is it to, uh, to be connecting to all these amazing people uh, uh, through the power of Hacking HR? So uh, very, very happy to see you all. My name is uh, Ernest Rulos. Uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands, and I'm uh, based out of uh, Washington, D.C. right now. I'll be moderating the, the breakout session for uh, for today. Um, and uh, well, technique, you know, that's something we all know from HR as well. Technique is something which is, uh, is very helpful when it works. Um, but I'm very happy to uh, at least uh, have two of the panel members uh, on board right now. Uh, and I think Catherine can hear us, uh, but she's not in there yet. So we will be hoping uh, to see her soon. But uh, a very welcome to you, uh, our panel for today, who I got to know as, as very uh, humble human beings. And uh, we have on, uh, on the top, we have Louis Efron, based out of Scotland today. Yeah. And then we have uh, on the bottom, we have Mike Bacanti, uh, based out of US today. Um, so to get to know you a little bit better, I would like to, first of all, ask you to uh, sort of take off your, your work mask. Um, so, so we get to see a little bit behind of the mask. Um, so, so authenticity is, is such an important thing in a, in a, uh, in, in a human workplace. So I would like to start with a question to both of you. Um, how would you describe? Woo, we got Catherine. Oh, great. Nice. Yeah. Yay. The band Woo. is back. Well, well, thank you for joining. It thank just you. got better, didn't it? It just got better. Yeah. <laughs> and you hear me? Yeah. We can. We can. Your timing is perfect because I, I was about to ask. Cool. about your uh, authentic self so so for each one of you could you describe yourself in three words um what your authentic self looks like and Catherine, you you just joined so so <laughs> kick it off okay so my authentic self is wife mother and systems thinker systems thinker thank you thank you for that louis I'm going to sort of follow suit on Catherine there, because for me as well, it's a husband first, a father second, and a writer um, third. It's the way I like to communicate and get my emotions and ideas out there. Yeah. Let's make sure we plug some of your books uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Know how, how good of a writer you are. And, and well, a nice uh, little bridge to Mike. Um, what are your free words? Yeah, I, it's simply lift others it's my intent every day yeah i love that that's what you wake up for it is it is brilliant brilliant uh just to get to know you a little bit more um Catherine, uh what did you want to become as a kid and 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 how does that sort of uh, tie into what you do in your professional life right now yeah do you know what there's two things Firstly, I was absolutely obsessed with Smokey and the Bandits. So um, <laughs> at one point I was obsessed about becoming a long distance lorry driver. Oh. But that aside, um, <laughs> I wanted to be a medical doctor actually. That's what I really wanted to do. I was fascinated by medicine and humans and bodies and um, possibly even the um, psychiatric medicine was particularly interesting for me. Um, and I suppose it, in a sense, I've, I've sort of come full circle. I ended up doing an anthropology degree at university. And um, I sort of, yeah, I'm fascinated by human biology, but also by human psychology and um, culture. Um, so caring for people, maybe caring for others um, is probably at the core of everything. Beautiful, yeah. I love that. Thank you. Uh, Louis, we, we had a chat about your sort of your, your oh, oh, all the countries you've been to. 
which is amazing in uh, so many countries. Uh, so, so my question to you: what, what, what kind of traveler are you? And then again, how, how does that sort of uh, uh, ties into your, your, your current uh, profession? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ernest. I'm actually an adventurer when I when it's come to traveling. I've lived, as I mentioned, about 45 different homes in my life, um, all over the world through work, through trans, through relocation, through my father's work when I was little, and then through my career. And when I get into new places that I don't know, whether it be countries or states or communities, I love to get out and um, eat the food, meet the people. I bring my running shoes everywhere I go. So I, I run through cities, sometimes in places probably I shouldn't run and uh, in places I, I that could be a bit dangerous, but I love getting out there and doing it. And uh, people in the next day usually freak out and they said, you've, you've run where in South Africa? But uh, it's it's been amazing opportunity to get to know environments and, and people. And my crossover for my career is I'm able to assimilate really easily into new environments every time so I've moved so much as a, throughout my life. And the study of people, and I love a big people watcher. So it's really helped me understand people and different ways of thinking and diversity and belonging and how all that comes together. Uh, so it's been just a great asset for me, my, my travels. I love it. And it's just helped me be better at what I do. Cool. Some great stories out there, I think. I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, well, talking about running, I, I think that the, the fittest guy of the four of us is, is Mike. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really would. I know sport has been, has been a, a great um, uh, has had a great impact throughout the whole of your life. So, so can you say tell us something about that and how that influenced your uh, and what kind of effect does it have on your professional life? I really appreciate that, Ernest. Um, so, saying that I'm fit, I appreciate that compliment. There's there's hope for us <laughs> old people, um, and it it has. I mean, being in sport and um, uh, being with others and looking at achievement, that's always been a big part. And so through childhood, I, I chased the dream of playing professional hockey. Um, I made it to get an opportunity to give that a try. Um, I hit the ceiling on that. So it was time to get a job and, and go figure out what was next. Um, and, you know, being around people, being in team environments is just kind of always driven a lot of the work that I do and and uh, a lot of the joy that I get out of engaging in the day. Cool. Well, thank you so much for 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 opening up. Um, it's uh, I'll post the, the three word question in the, in the comment section as well, because we, we would love to get to know our, our viewers better as well. So um, let me do that in a bit. And if you if you want to know more about the professional background of our panel, you can visit their uh, their LinkedIn profile. That's something I'll post out there as well. Um, so going going to the topic for today, human first, and then the quest to build a more human workplace. Um, we'll pro pretty much go into um, the current state, future state, the role of HR. And, and what kind of actions we can take. Um, it will be a, a free-flowing conversation. And uh, of course, there's room for questions from you, our viewers. So please post them in, uh, in the comment box so we can, uh, we can get them out there to, uh, to our panel. Um, so being on a quest to a more human workplace, which pretty much means that we're, we're not there yet. So, so Catherine, maybe you can and light us a little bit how you see the the current state. So how how do you, how does the human workplace over is overall at the moment? Um, so I think the human the workplace is full of emotion, um, and a lot of it is unexpressed emotion, mm -hmm. and it's largely down to the fact that we are in this um, constant state of flux and change. And obviously, technology disruption has brought that about, as well as other sort of socio-political changes that are happening in the world. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people are in a state of fear, at some state of stress. And obviously, there's good stress and there's bad stress. But certainly, the people that I come into contact with um, when I'm doing my coaching work, um, and these are people who are considered high performance, high 
uh, people who are, you know, standout talent for organizations. And they are, they're not doing their best work. They're not able to do their best work because they are in, in some state of fear, some state of state of stress. Um, and that's a huge concern. And it should be a huge concern for organizations. Um, because in a sense, with all this change, they are, they are um, needing their best talent to step up at this point mm -hmm. and see the opportunity. But I, there, there's huge constraints. Um, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anxiety. Um, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of sadness. Um, people are not um, operating um, at their best at the moment. That's that's the experience that I have seen and I see on a on a daily basis. I I, I can fully agree. Uh, it's, it's a big thing, the fear thing, right? Mike, you're laughing. Uh, how, how could you relate to this? Yeah, I I, I think that is. Um, it sounds alarming, right, to hear that. But but I think Catherine is really pointing to the truth and. Um, when we're in conversations, I think we hear signs of this every day, if not directly those words every day. And um, I, I, I believe that it, it, it's an opportunity for us to realize we're at an inflection point that where we have been in the past no longer suits us. In many work environments, the majority of work environments, and I get a chance to see a lot of them, it's clear that the path we're on is neither desirable nor sustainable. That the, the, the mental and physical fitness toll our current work conditions are putting on human beings has been stretched to the max. Um, and I believe we have um, set this up with our systems that we've relied on for over a hundred years that no longer serve us because we are in a new era. We're in an information era. We're in a non-industrial era, um, which cracks me up when I hear the fourth industrial revolution because there's mm -hmm. nothing industrial about this revolution. Um, that it, it's really time to reprioritize and put the, the human wellness and, and the conditions of how we treat, how we grow, how we encourage and acknowledge people to become their best is our real opportunity. And it has little to do with our systems, which are there to support our good thinking and our good works and our and our better intentions. Yeah. You know, and, and Bill, maybe Ernest, you're going to ask me, but I'll, I'll just jump in and, and build on that. No, that's good. Uh, because I think the, the challenge we, I think we're talking about in this is evidence of what's happening. And so this cancer growing in the workplace and society in general with a spike in um, depression, anxiety, loneliness, suicide, globally, it's getting worse and worse. And I think the challenge for me as I think about this is the disconnection from meaningful human connections in our in our uh basic humanity. I mean, we grew up, we evolved in a tribal sense, right? Needing people, needing these connections. And technology, while it's done some amazing things to move us forward, it's also pulling us further away from each other. I, mean, I had a, my daughter had a party, a birthday party a couple months ago. I was looking around all the parents and I always go to birthday parties with the kids. I want to watch them play and interact. And I looked around the room and all the parents were on their phones, right? No one was watching their kids. No one was talking. You go to restaurants, you see more and more of this. There's more and more remote working. I mean, unfortunately, this whole issue with the coronavirus, it's accelerating people working from home, which is great. But the more and more we're isolated from each other, the bigger this issue is going to become. So we've got to figure out ways of bringing that meaningful human connection back into the workplace and our lives in general. Yeah, Catherine, so, so the isolation, how, how is that something from your anthropology background? How, how do you look into the isolation you're seeing now in the in the current workplace well look humans just don't do well on their own um and there's lots of evidence for that you know if you shut a human in a room in a darkened room with no sensory experience they 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 either go mad or they die so i'm just i'm just putting it out there um, so we we have evolved um as Lewis said we have we have evolved in groups and there's good reason for that and it's largely to do with survival. Um, and so all of our physical development and our um, brain development 
is suited to human connection. That's how we, that sense of belonging is yep. what humans want and they need. It's an emotion, it's a huge emotional driver. That's not to say that we can't and shouldn't act independently. Obviously, there's a balance to be struck. But that sense of community and workplace, the workplace as a community, um, a place where you can connect and socialize and uh, share ideas with each other, that is at the core of um, humanizing the workplace, um, that sense of um, being part of something bigger than yourself. It's, it's incredibly important for um, that, I, that that emotional fitness that Mike mentioned. Yeah. So it, 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 that, that, this emotional, these emotional needs that we all have, we strive every day to meet these needs. And I think that's that's the piece that a lot of workplaces are missing. Um, they, they uh, in a sense, we've got so used to operating just in terms of our intellect, we have completely disconnected from our emotions and also from our physical body. Mike, I'm sure you, you, you've got something to say on that. Um, well, uh, you know, I'm in agreement with you. And, and so, you know, oftentimes we hear from people as we're in these conversations is, well, how do we change that? So if we agree with everything that's being said, what's the path forward? And we think of big sweeping changes that have to mirror the big sweeping changes that are coming at us. And I believe it's actually just a, a series of small incremental tweaks. Um, if I'm going to change my physical form, get in shape, which I did, I had lost 35 pounds and got myself back in reasonable condition. But it wasn't just deciding one day I'm gonna drop 35 pounds and, and become healthier. It was a, a series of days and events and discipline of diet and exercise and doing those things. And, and after time, it took place. And so, you know, practically building that into our workplaces, really evaluating how do we run meetings, right? So I show up Monday morning, I jump into a staff meeting and I'm asked, what did I do? What am I going to do? Not how are you? What's happening? I sense stress in you today. Let's get back to that. It's just kind of, hey, I've got a bunch of data from last week. We're going to review everything you did, right? And so we, we operate in this um, looking backwards sense. We call forecasting, forecasting, and it's not. It's let's review what has happened and guess the future. We don't do anything to build up the resilience and the intent and the enthusiasm in people to really bring their best that day. And that's our great opportunity is just to pause, um, give an opportunity to connect with people and it does not take a lot of time. It's just a change of mindset. Uh, Ernest, can I, can I jump in? I, yeah. I love to, yeah, it's okay. I, I love to get into yeah. that more, a little bit more detail there on, on, on the process that we're having currently and, and, and the systems and, and uh, which one are limiting us and, and, and sort of where we, where we need to go. Uh, yeah, so, and, and yeah. also, Mike, you do look great. I will, uh, I will confirm that as well. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the cool thing about what you said, Mike, too, about the, the little time it takes, but the other thing, when you think about a business, always worry about the you know, more competitive nature of the global workforce now, of the market, of p &Ls getting tight, it costs absolutely nothing to do these things too. Yeah. I just spent um, two years working with a remarkable company called DaVita and they, before each meeting, they do these things called check-ins. And to your point, Mike, that's what they would do. They'd go around the table and personally connect with each other. And whether it be live or whether it be on video or whether it be um, at a lunch or dinner, whatever it may be, just taking time to get to know that person and connecting, looking into their eyes, having maybe um, technology blackouts or times we don't send emails or things like that, just to force us back into looking to each other's eyes, getting to know each other, seeing how we feel and how that emotions, to Catherine's point, plays out and addressing that, right? And if people are having challenges in the workplace, talk about it. This is why this whole issue is bubbling up around this issues in suicide and things in the workplace, because people don't have a forum to talk about it. They could be single, 
they could have a whole family around them that don't talk. But if you get in a city, you just get it up on stage. And if there's someone, an employee's having a challenge, talk about it openly. And when they do it, it's going to encourage other people to start talking about it. Then you'll start getting a dialogue around this. And if people can talk about it, to the earlier point Catherine made, it, it just releases the pressure around those emotions, right? And, and it's okay, right? You don't have to bottle it up and it doesn't bubble up into disastrous results. And that's what we have to just get back to across our lives. I, I love that you're giving all the examples as well. Uh, thank, thanks for that, Luis, because uh, that's very helpful for, for, for the audience, uh, seeing how how to make the workplace more human. Uh, we have some interaction going on on the, on the chat. So first of all, I would like to thank Jared for opening up as well, giving free, uh, free words, uh, being his authentic self, human and em empathic and restless. So uh, thank you for that, Jared. And, and we got some questions as well. So I think a very relevant question, why are we talking about this? So, so why is it so relevant at the moment and why it's so popular to talk about um, making the, the, the workplace more human? Catherine, could you answer that? I, ultimately, it comes down to one thing, which is performance, right? In terms of work, you want the greatest output from, your, from the human beings in your business. Right. And yeah. as Mike said earlier, the old system's not working anymore. And actually, the more we digitize and um, the more technology is introduced into our workplace, there's, there is a huge opportunity for us to become more human, actually. Not less human, but more human. Humans are not robots. I see that statement <laughs> a lot on LinkedIn. And um, it, it absolutely rings, rings true. We're not, um, we're not on a factory floor anymore. Um, and in, yeah. in a sense, I, I'm, I'm actually really glad that we have technology because technology is going to do all the boring stuff. It's going to automate a whole lot of stuff that we frankly shouldn't be doing. Um, we've had to put up with for a long, long time. We can automate all of that stuff and it lifts humans to do what we do re uh, really, really well, which is to create. We are natural ideators, okay? But in order to produce these amazing ideas that are going to take companies on to the next uh, level of, of production and um, just performing at their very, very best, um, you you need to uh, understand that humans are chemical balls of energy, and I think this is this is really important. And I was while Lewis was talking about the eye contact piece and the trust piece, the reason that really good eye contact produces trust is because it helps the human brain to release a, a neurotransmitter, a, a hormone called oxytocin. And so, um, and, and this is the power of actually connecting with other humans because even the simple act of looking into someone else's eyes and paying attention to other humans releases hormones chemicals and neurotransmitters that enables us to think better. It enables us to create better. It puts us into a state of mind that is called what, what is called flow. So that connectivity between human beings ultimately creates um, a very, very different set of circumstances hormonal changes in the brain that actually allows us to learn faster uh, so it accelerates our learning it en enables us to think more clearly th th this this is the um the irony of the situation fear the state of fear that we're in at the moment puts there are other very different chemicals we puts our brain into a very different chemical state um including uh, higher levels of testosterone, um, high, very, very high levels of cortisol. And these chemicals, these hormones, stop us producing the very chemicals that would actually enable us to make great decisions and to innovate. 
And that's the that's what that's what's so I ironical if that's such a word i don't think it is <laughs> that's what's so um nuts about what uh, the, the the stress on human beings right now it is we've created a situation where we have this need for um visionary leadership right now we have this requirement for uh learn 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 we have this requirement for uh, lifting people's brains so that they're able to solve complex problems. And yet the human brains in most workplaces not right now are filled with cortisol and testosterone. So people cannot even think straight. So can Absolutely. Uh, and that's, yeah, yeah, that's for, yeah, you go. I, I, just want, I just want to jump in because I'm passionate about this topic too. And everything, I agree 100% with everything what Catherine's saying. But the other thing that, the reason why we're talking about this is also a, bu a business issue, right? When you look mm -hmm. at the, the the global population, 80% of the workforce, they say over 80% isn't happy with what they do, or they have challenges at work or other areas in their lives. So if you're paying someone to go in and do a job, right? And they're distracted by other things in their lives or other emotions that they can't deal with they're not going to be focusing on the work the quality of work is going to suffer the retention is going to suffer the team dynamics is going to suffer and it goes right to your bottom line of your business so imagine if we unleash that if there's even 50 percent of these people were fully focused on their work um how much better organizations would do how much better the economy would be so it's, it's both a personal social issue and an economic issue in my mind yeah Definitely. And, and it's interesting like uh, what Jared um, uh, put out there as well. So what we're talking about, we're talking about individuals. So we pretty much have processes and, 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 and systems in place, which one size fits all, right, Mike? Uh, but what, yeah. what, what? So, I, you know, it's funny because I, I'm loving the chat right now, right? So Dr. Katie 30 um, uh, uh, theory, she she put in there that, you know, I, I confess that this topic was completely off my radar. You know, I've been a goal oriented action first, you know, the things we've been taught that make us become high performers and, and, you know, rise to a level where we're um, involved with others, we're leading others, we're responsible for others. And when we talk about being more human in the workplace, I want to congratulate Dr. Kitty for the vulnerability to type that in. And that's really all we're talking about here is the willingness to say how I've operated every day in the past. Am I strong enough to make a decision to look at another option, not even make the decision to change, but am I strong enough and vulnerable enough to consider something different? And, I love how Catherine frames up, you know, the human, the scientific human side, because it's important to understand how we operate as humans. So we can better understand what our relationships are like, because I think in the essence, what we're really talking about here is we need each other. And the relationships we have during our day with our clients, with our bosses, with our peers, with our family, with the checkout person at the grocery store are really critical to our wellness, our happiness, and, and therefore our performance. That's the great opportunity is lighten up and smile and have some fun with this because we're just giving each other virtually, if that feels better and we don't want to bring the personal stuff. Um, but, you know, as Dr. Uh, I mean, as Jared had said also in the chat is, people don't necessarily want to bring all their personal stuff in. And my comment back to that is medical records are not required. So we don't have to come in and say, hi, how are you? Oh, I have this terrible rash. It's, uh, it's like, you know, you, you can keep your medical records out of it, but you can say, <laughs> you know what? I'm a little tired coming into this week. I could use some human interaction here to pick me up and get me refocused and rededicated to what we're trying to accomplish together we're missing the good basic stuff because we've become so brilliant in orchestrating process and systems and, and controls to drive everybody into the same behaviors, repeatable behaviors. The assumption is every organic blob that we send a paycheck to is the same. And 
<laughs> like, that's just not true. Yeah, and I, I do think actually there to that comment, and by the way, I'm shout out to Katie, because Katie, her board, and the cool thing about Katie, she's a brilliant person, and she's also helping educate the future of HR around this stuff. So it's awesome to see her jump in on that. But I also, to the, I think it was Jared comment about people not wanting to bring this to work. I also think there's probably more people that want to talk about it at work that are saying they don't, but because they just don't feel comfortable in a safe environment. Because the reality is, we're all here talking about social well-being at work and the importance of it. But being in HR for many years in my life, I know if you have a leader that has a, a psychological issue or challenge and they start talking about it at work, there's rare, there's few, I guess, environments and culture that will really embrace that. And it'll be, it'll be a mark on you. And that's the reality of the, the situation right now. So we have to break through this whole dynamic so this conversation is genuine, mm. to Catherine's point, you can trust it, but there's very few organizations. This is all pie in the sky right now that we're talking about. But most situations, you bring your problems to work, you're gonna be marked, reality in HR. That's just how it, how it works, right? And it's gonna, it's gonna limit your career and it shouldn't do it any longer. Yeah, and it's what I, I, I bring to the, to, to the conversation as well in the, in the chat about trust levels. So I, I don't know if you want to catch on that, Catherine. Uh, about, about trust levels at work. Um, well, it's interesting. Um, Edelman, a big global comms company, they do a trust survey every year. I think actually levels of trust in organizations, the corporate world is is relatively high at the moment compared to government and other, and other institutions. <laughs> so I think actually human beings are looking to their organizations for help actually in um, some, some kind of direction. Uh, but I, I think uh, I'm a huge fan of Paul Zak, who is um, who famously has written a, a number of books, one of which is called Trust Factors. Um, I highly recommend that book to anyone listening. Um, but it's that trust is absolutely the it's the basis. It's the core foundation for any human relationship. And once that trust goes. That's it. It takes a long time to build um, and only seconds to break. And um, I think the, that, that the, you know, the level of trust uh, people have in organizations right now, particularly with their bosses, is probably quite low. And one of the reasons for that is the fact that um, there is a huge opportunity, I think, right now for particularly people who are in the C-suite of companies to be actively communicating to their workforces around um, what they are doing to support retraining and upskilling their workforce. People are huge, are very, very scared about losing their jobs right now. I'm just putting it out there. Um, particularly people who are in, are in lower skilled jobs. Um, there is so much stuff in the media about robots are going to take my job. Now, whether or not you, know, you, you, you sort of buy into that or not, the truth is that literally every day in the, in the, in the newspaper headlines, there are uh, reports of uh, ex-CEO talking about, you know, within the next five years, 40% of our workforce is going to be lost and automated. Um, I don't think it's going to be quite that dramatic, but, you know, seriously, the, the workplace is changing. I mean, automation is happening. Artificial intelligence, robots, all of that stuff, it's, it's, it's really happening. Um, and uh, so do I, do I trust? I think, I think a really interesting question for a lot of people is, do I trust that you have got my back? Do I trust that you... Uh, want me to succeed rather than a very individualistic uh, approach, which unfortunately a lot of leaders fall into the bracket of me, me, me. I want to advance my career. I want to do well for myself um, rather than uh, moving away from that kind of selfish pursuit of career and money fame, status, whatever it is, and actually realizing that when you walk in the shoes of a leader, the mindset needs to be the opposite of that. It yeah, needs and, to be about... And, like, and, yeah. And, yeah, the, the irony of this, so what Catherine's talking about, the irony is it that if you want to be a successful leader, 
the more you serve and focus on others, that's how you become and you rise up and you make more money and get more promotions. The great leaders do that. So if you focus on yourself, <laughs> yeah. you are not a leader, <laughs> bottom line, right? It's about servant leadership. I'm a big fan of that. The more you serve others in life, the more it comes back. If you focus yeah. on helping your people and being successful, you are going to rise with the cream, right? <laughs> that's how it works. But it's, it's ironic well, that people don't get that, right? Yeah, I think it can work that way. I think that we're coming to a stage and, and um, you know, if we look at where we are in a maturity curve, I, I think we've tilted way the other way. If you look at the percentage of CEOs in companies right now, large companies, look at the Fortune 500. If you were really to profile those CEOs, you would find a high majority of narcissistic behaviors that have made it to the top of the of those ranks. Those were the behaviors, those were the sharp elbows, climb over every, win at every cost, um, flush out the bottom of the, the, the barrel. Um, that's what has been rewarded and grown in. So if we're going to take and look at personal epiphanies of a group of people that are now in leadership, I think we're going to totally miss the boat and we're going to miss the great opportunity here because Think of even when you were a child, you had relationships with children at school and you didn't ask your parents for permission to behave well and have friendships and enjoy each other. And now all of a sudden we're in our late adult lives, we're fully grown human beings and we're waiting for somebody in a top chair to give us permission to have healthy relationships. And I, I wanna challenge that notion we cannot sit and wait for permission from this hierarchical and um, system that we're in right now, because that's that's depending on trickle down. And I think there's a lot of belief that says that doesn't work. We all have the opportunity and the responsibility to enhance the situation that we're in. I ask people all the time, they're saying, well, our CEO doesn't set up that environment. And I ask them, how much time during a week do you spend with the CEO? And they say, well, I, I never do. How much time do you spend with the people sitting around you? How much time do you spend with your team in meetings? The impact we can make by changing our mind and focusing our intent is tremendous. And if you get one pot of people that's behaving well with their relationships, operating as a great team, and then another pod and another pod and another pod, the, the performance is going to be great. The narcissistic CEO is going to be smiling because the revenues are going to be pouring in and nobody had to ask for permission. So if, if I could throw just one other question to build on Mike's too around the narcissistic leaders, which I completely agree that are out there. But I always wonder is what if those people did things differently and, and behave the way we're talking, how much more success they potentially could have had, right? The people who changed the world did some amazing things, but perhaps they could change the world even more doing it in a different light. And I always, you know, I've had examples in my career where sales leaders were delivering their, their, their sales every year, year on year in big corporations. And they were let go because they were doing it the wrong way. They brought a leader and they do it the right way. And they brought five more percent into the business, right? It's a big leap of faith, right? Yeah. But it, I, you know, maybe it's my idealistic outlook on life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I, I think Microsoft is a really good example of that, actually. Um, with Satya Nadella taking over as CEO. I think he has really injected a very, very different, um, very different priorities. And, you know, he obviously wrote, wrote, wrote about his son's illness and how that has really, uh, his, his son's disability and how that has really impacted how he thinks and how he approaches life. And he's, he is very much embracing that new kind of humble, um, empathetic, mm -hmm. Yeah. style of leadership um the, the listening the coaching um and i think in a way actually the microsoft linkedin uh, acquisition was is, is very interesting um in fact i think those two cultures are very uh, aligned um uh just because um i know that linkedin is really big on coaching culture and listening and leaning into and and i think that's that is possibly one of the if you were to do one thing differently, that is, I, I think there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of noise in a lot of companies. Um, and I think actually stopping and listening 
is one of the, it, it sounds really simple, it sounds really, uh, or how could that change anything? But actually, if leaders could just stop and really listen to what people are saying to them and taking people, what people say seriously um, and making those mm -hmm. connections. This, th th there's too much, there's too, unfortunately, there is too much bravado. There is too much um, talk for the sake of talking. And there's not enough listening. There's not enough quiet. There's not and, enough still. And I'll just say a 30 second caution on this, too, because I agree with everything, but it's got to be genuine. So leaders that are listening out there right. that sort of put this facade up, right? Humans are very intuitive. They, they read the subtext, right? We've all had leaders get up and say all the right things and, and you know they don't believe in their heart. So if you're going to embrace this, it must be in your heart and mind. You must want this and believe in it or it's gonna come off phony and it's gonna work the opposite way. It's gonna be a detriment to well, you. Well, I think that's a really interesting point. Mike, oh yeah, take, take this uh, one. Yeah. No, just just really, I'll, I'll take the question, but, but on that is um, when we adopt language without changing the behaviors, there is a further disconnect, right? So it actually becomes more harmful than helpful. I think that's a great point, Luis. Thanks. So, so we're, we're, we're almost 45 minutes on, on the way and I, I, I <laughs> looking into the, the comments and it's a, it's such a great discussion so far. Um, and, um, I think that there, there are two things that I would like to, uh, uh, address one question from Lydia about, um, do you think it is more critical? Uh, do you think it is a more critical need for the younger employees to be human, authentic, whole self at work? May I? May I, I'm sorry, I, I just, but I love this. So my, my plea with, with all of us that engage in the workplace, let's save the children, please. Because what happens is the further we go through our career, with each promotion we get, it's almost like going through a toll booth. And the toll we pay as we progress to that next level is a little piece of our soul is a little piece of our heart that we have to blacken to capitulate and to assimilate into whatever you know the climate is that we're that we're moving into and that is why when leaders get to a certain level they've given away so much of their true authentic caring self and i believe that there's more information available now for this for for the current generations they have more choice. They, they don't have to believe the one voice at business that they're, they're heard from, right? They can jump on and say, I just listened to three podcasts and, and a couple of TED Talks and, and watch these five YouTube videos. These people know a lot more than you. They're a lot more advanced. These people are involved. Matter of fact, I, I've sent my resume. I, I've got a foot out the door because they've got a much better way than you do. And that wasn't available even a decade ago. Um, and so there's a big yeah. swing here. And I think that we need to honor and hold true to what we all probably felt back in our early careers also, but got beaten out of us as we capitulated along the path. Yeah. So um, thank you for that question. And then I think one topic uh, which, which we all, uh, well, we're all dealing with data nowadays, right? And, and we have all these metrics, uh, metrics out there. Uh, we know all how to how to measure revenue. Um, all the sales sales measurements are out there. But I think Jared makes a very nice comment. Um, the, the the balance of analytics versus human human analytics. I have to pronounce it rightly. Uh, so so so, Catherine, how do you feel about human measurements? And what kind of KPIs could we be looking at? Yeah, I think, look, I think analytics can play. I'm, I'm very much a, a data geek. I like looking at data. I like uh, analyzing it and sort of pulling out insights. Um, that's part of the, the, the system's thinking. But, um, you know, I think it, I think it is, it's going to help organizations. But it's, it's, you know, are you going to use that information against humans? Or are you going to use that information to help and lift humans? 
And that's, yeah. an, that's an ethical discussion. And unfortunately, there are people out there building stuff right now, engineers, highly, uh, highly intelligent uh, people who are building these hugely complex systems and data capture systems. And uh, but there's, there's, there seems to be no kind of governing framework around that for ethics and biases and all all of that kind of stuff um and i think it's 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 quite it's it's a bit scary actually um and there doesn't seem to be a lot of joined up thinking um in terms of you know really having kind of glo i think global a, a kind of global um benchmarks or um something some kind of ethical framework um that should apply to anyone who kind of is 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 building this this new technology um because i think we're we're in danger of um creating a bit of a monster that would be my that would be my take on it um Lewis, so i think i think analytics, analytics is important and it can help it can help to um to lift humans Lewis, Lewis how, how how could we um measure meaningful human connection is would, would that be a measurement relevant for HR to be uh, to be measuring. Yeah, I, you know, I I think so. I mean, I, I think technology can certainly help with this. If we're if we're developing technology that has a DNA woven in that actually is focused on the support and success and growth of humans, we could build things into these this technology platforms that could measure even human interaction. I I love this topic because I I completely agree that technology has been a game changer for our lives and will continue to do so. But we have to keep a, a sort of a focus point on how it's supporting and improving humanity. So I think these connections, technology can help with that. And how many times we actually interact yeah. and actually reach out to people that are, it knows, for example, it could build technology profiles or just like Facebook or anything like that, that will know the users, right? And it'll know if they work at home alone, how much they interact with other team members, when they go out to lunch, how much they exercise, all these type of things can be captured. I think these are the meaningful metrics because the engagement metrics don't really work. Satisfaction metrics don't really work. We're talking about enablement now. None of it really gets to the heart of connecting people. But I think there's there's going to have to be something brand new. And in my mind, it's around this data capturing of the actual movement of your people in the workforce. What, what are they doing? How many times are they mm -hmm. looking into the eyes of someone else and having meaningful connections? And technology can support this. I mean, social media is do, it knows a lot about who we are, it knows more things than we, we care to know that they know about us. And if we use this correctly, it, it'll, it'll be a game changer for our businesses and for people in humanity, because you can't build a house without, without a ruler, right? I believe you, you must have metrics and you must be able to know if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And this can be captured using technology today. We, we have to have information and, um, and what I do believe is, is be, because I come out of the technology world and I'm, you know, very familiar where, where it is going. I think it's, it's still at an early stage. I, I try to simplify it to this is the tools that the powerful tools that are going to be in our hands very shortly, if they're not already here, are going to require new skills to use those powerful tools. And the, the challenge we have is how do we prepare people for these new tools? Because the propensity to have them misused is greater than the propensity to have them used for benefit right now. And part of that is we're, we're not acknowledging the need for people to evolve to the stage with skills and understanding to be able to use those tools effectively. We're gonna be able to measure everything immediately um, and that puts us in a forward-looking place you know another thing i just want to say because this has been so much fun being with you but also the interaction in the chat has just been brilliant and i and i want to thank everybody for that um, and and i'm enthusiastic about a relationship i can't wait to have um potentially a conversation um with with these wonderful people that have that have you know been part of this conversation today because I think you've guided it with your responses in a really wonderful way. Um, 
There's great hope for what we're doing. This is not a dismal situation. Catherine talked a lot about the power of fear and fear has been used as a tool, a really effective tool for decades, for generations. And it's time to put that hammer down and embrace these new tools that we have that are gonna be powerful technology tools. But we have to have a little bit of compassion, empathy and love in our use of these powerful tools so we're not doing harm. I think, I think that's what I think. <laughs> I agree. I started. I started with the. I, uh, I started the uh, introduction with uh, finding out that you all are such humble, humble human beings, and uh, again, it shows in the in in, in this this conver conversation. And and I'm so happy to to have all these uh, humble people on the on the chat as well. And I think, Eddie, you. Uh, you really uh, put out a question out there, which is uh, uh, to get some takeaway out of this uh, and ask the panel uh, to see what kind of meaningful action we could take. So uh, it's going to be a question for all of you. Uh, Louis, would you would you um, take it away? What what kind of meaningful action can we take to build that human workplace? Yeah, Katie, thank you for the conversation, for joining. And I mirror Mike's comments. It's been a great dialogue I've been watching here. So um, we touched on this a bit already, but it's it's walk the talk. You know, being genuine, authentic is how you started this whole conversation, Ernest, today, is great leaders are authentic and they believe in what they believe. And you've got to find as a leader, you've got to put yourself in a situation where there's alignment with what you believe, right? And if you don't believe in what someone's doing or the, or the, the initiatives or objectives you're trying to accomplish with your team, you're best off moving on. So I think it starts with you first. I think it starts with everybody in the organization understanding what's really important to you. How does it connect what's important to the organization? And how are you serving your customers, your community in the world, right? What's that purpose through line? And, and for me, that's the power of a business today. It's combining so this purpose and execution together, right? Understanding why you exist above and beyond, the oven bond making money, right? Um, how you're helping to do that and how you're helping aligning your talent to do that. And as leaders in organization, we simply have to, in my mind, it's just, it's sort of simple, but it's not, right? It's just being who you are, showing up who you are, saying what's on your mind, being believable, authentic, and, and genuinely wanting to connect to others. And when you do that and you walk the talk, people get it, right? They read the subtext and they know you care about them and you won't always get it right and you'll make mistakes and this and that, but as long as in the day people know that your heart and mind's in it and you truly care about them, you care about what you're doing, you're just gonna have an increased engagement, more inspiration, and things are just gonna be better. Thank you for that. Things are gonna be better. Thank <laughs> you, Louise. Uh, Catherine, what can we do? What kind of message will we take? I, I, so I'm, I'm, uh, I think um, companies, what, what people can start doing is actually measuring uh, the emotional fitness of their organizations. Um, so that's around the piece around psychological safety. It's around uh, belonging. It's around um, understanding that people want autonomy. Um, and it's also around people feeling that they are valued for who they are, that they are not just this kind of number. They are a unique human being with unique skills and unique talents. And um, they want people to, people, humans want to be understood for their uniqueness, um, for their uniqueness, for their, for their wisdom, for their empathy for all of these great character strengths that we we, we all want to showcase um so i think that that piece around emotional fitness psychological fitness like for me personally i think most um, performance issues are related to um psychological issues that humans are facing whether or not that's around the fear piece uh, around anxiety around loneliness around um you know not getting their emotional needs met struggling to to meet their emotional needs because they feel disen disenfranchised from their organizations um and and the, the truth is to that the question earlier in 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 the comments unlike our generation i'm i'm turning 50 this year young people have got options now 
They will not stay in your company. They will not put up with it. They will go off and become freelancers. They will con become consultants. These guys are fearless, like we all were when we were like 21, 18, whatever. They they will just leave you. And this is the this is the um, this is the threat for business. There is a massive war for talent, and these young people they are all they are highly skilled in in digital. They've grown up with technology. Um, they have choices. They can self-learn. They can get free Google courses. They do not need you as much as you need them. And I think that's that's perhaps the dynamic that has changed, that the, the, the talent out there in the market does not need to be in incarcerated in work anymore. They can choose a different path. And that's where companies, unfortunately, and I would say probably some of the most talented people right now have, are, are either thinking about leaving their organizations or they have already left. Yeah. They're setting up their own companies. They're setting up as consultants. Yeah. They're doing it. I just. That's the, that's the big threat to business. I just have one simple thing, Ernest. Absolutely. And, absolutely. And We've got that, two more minutes. Um, Take it away. Yeah. And just keeping it short is that. Um, I think we can have some fun with this. And we look at the, the way people can adopt things. It's, you know, 2% incremental changes will actually get it done. Um, there's studies, there's science to that. So I loved in the chat, we were talking about, you know, as Enrique kicked off with making the micro adjustments, the micro actions. But here's a fun one to contemplate, perhaps for the rest of the week, see how this goes. What we stop doing is much more important than what we do next. And so we have a barrage of systems, operations, processes, things we've known and learned and we do so excellently. What do we have the opportunity to stop doing to make room for the new things? You know, if we're vacuuming the rug in our home, eventually that filter gets a little full, just empty the filter. Like give give some new airflow a chance into your organization. And I think that is a fun exercise. It depressurizes things. It gives the opportunity for new ideas. We can try things in small incremental steps and actually have some fun with it. That would be my encouragement. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, again, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you guys. Um, I think it has been um, amazing to hear from you, from your experience, your knowledge, and I think um, having having the chat going going off like this is, was 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 very exciting and very helpful for for our conversation as well. So uh, I want to thank everybody who's been watching all over the world. Again, it's amazing that we can connect with so many people, diving into a subject which is so important, and 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 we're all on the quest to make 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 the workplace more human. So. I hope this helped a little bit more on that quest and makes it easier to make the workplace more human. Um, I would say keep on connecting. Uh, I think we have a very, a very valuable uh, network out here. People who all bring their own vision, who bring their own self, who bring their authenticity to, to the table. Um, so uh, let's keep connecting and make sure that we, uh, we keep going forward in, uh, in, in our quest. Uh, thank you so much, Luis. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Catherine, for being on board. Uh, I put out the, the links to the LinkedIn uh, out in the comments. Uh, so if you want to link to all of us, uh, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're definitely open uh, to uh, to go on with the conversation and, and have a maybe one-on-one -on -one to learn from each other. Um, we're going to be kicked off in two minutes. So let me let me take 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 uh, use this time we still have left lewis one book everybody should be reading uh -huh. well you can you can pick up mine i don't want to be i don't want to be overly pump myself up but purpose peace execution <laughs> captures everything i'm talking about pick that one up and actually lost connections by johan hari great book about this whole connection of the concept of meaningful connections thanks mike your book um, so I just wrote a book called Believership, the Superpower Beyond Leadership, but the book that had an impact on me, probably um, one of the best in the last uh, several years is The Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker. Nice. Catherine, quick, another book. 
You already gave a great book. Uh, the, cult the Culture Code. The Culture Code. And I've forgotten the name. It's a New York bestseller. You'll find it if you put it into Amazon. I've forgotten the name of the author, but it, you know, he's it's brilliant. It's full of amazing case studies of real live businesses that are doing things differently. Ooh. Well, thank you. Ernest. So much. Ernest. Yeah. Thank you. Can we, everybody, thank you. Ernest. Thank Yay. you. Well done. <laughs> we did great in time management. 11.15. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the of the sessions during the day and in the coming days. Enrique. Many, many, many thanks to you. Uh, doing a great job out there. And uh, well, enjoy and then uh, keep on connecting. Thank you so thanks much. All. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.